Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. We will continue tomorrow or today on the lecture about mortality. And I just want to mention that on that lecture about the sources of demographic information, I had discussed with you some issues that the census is passing through that the federal government wanted to end activities earlier than expected. There were some issues there. And I also mentioned how the census can be used for political reasons. And I just added here this extra slide about this article that appears in the New York Times in which it shows that actually this Thomas Hofeller, who used to be a GOP strategist, when he died, he, his daughter encountered a series of hard drives with his notes. And there he discussed a series of reasons of uh, why adding a citizenship question to the 2020 census would benefit Republicans exactly because you could divide the uh, congressional districts by putting more uh, population that usually vote more Democrats all together. And she even found some notes in which the argument that the current administration uses was using to add the citizenship question uh, as, um, as a way to enforce the 1965 voting right in X was actually just a, an excuse for the real reason of actually producing gerrymandered maps. By the end, that citizenship question was not included in the 2020 census, but just the fact that that discussion came into the public sphere kind of made a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants and other groups um, not being willing to answer the census. And then after that, we saw now the issues of wanting to cut short the time and that makes it harder for the Census Bureau to reach some uh, vulnerable populations that we discussed before. And in the lecture about race ethnicity, I also discussed some um, discussions, some debate that was done, or studies that were done inside the Census Bureau in order to measure race ethnicity in different ways. But then the current administration just denied all those studies and the question about race ethnicity, it's similar as it was before. But this is just to show that census data, it's really important for demographic, for technical reasons to implement public policies, but it can be used really clearly in a political manner. So that's why demography is really linked into political decisions, to things that are going on in the country. And you can take a look at this um, article that was published at, at the New York Times in May 2019. And I updated this, this lecture in our website. For continuing on our lecture about uh, mortality, so far we just went through the introduction and measurement of mortality. And we talked about standardization of crude birth rates, sorry, crude death rates, and about how to estimate uh, life expectancy for several age groups with life tables. And then now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of mortality in the world, mortality trends and causes of death, mortality and longevity in the US, and then focus on the topic about infant mortality some theoretical discussions of what we expect for the future of mortality that's discussed in the textbook. And then I just added some more recent data about the coronavirus pandemic. In the first lecture of this semester, I added some graphs and I added for uh, several countries and then the US and I broke it down the US uh, for several areas within the US by looking at the map of the US and, and then also show you some uh, data for, for Texas specifically and for college towns. For these specific uh, slides here, I added only focusing on the US because the other stuff we discussed before 
including some technical language about what it means to flatten the curve of the pandemic and so on. So I'm just complementing things that we already talked before, adding more things into the discussion. And so the, um, um, let me just see if I can put the chat here in front of my screen, if it's gonna work today. No, it's not working. So if you wanna ask something, please um, just unmute yourself and ask the question because it doesn't appear on my screen. So in this uh, portion now of the, the, the chapter, we talk about the short, give you a short history of mortality in the world, including the, uh, the defining what it, health and mortality transitions are. And this is actually related to the classes related to uh, the demographic transition theory. Health and mortality changes over time. What is lifespan and longevity? Disease and death over the life cycle. Causes of poor health and causes of death. And health and mortality uh, inequalities as well. It's gonna be one topic within the history of mortality in the world. So whenever we are talking about mortality, we have to consider also uh, the health of the population is not just uh, how often are people dying or what's the life expectancy uh, at birth for a population. It's not just the average number of years that people live if they had specific age, specific death rates, but it's also related to the health of the population. What are the most common diseases that are prevalent in a specific population, in a specific year, in a specific time. So whenever you're talking about mortality, it's also important to talk about morbidity. So morbidity, it's related to health, it's related to the prevalence of specific diseases. And um, the mortality, as we saw in the previous demographic transition uh, theory discussion, mortality starts to decline because of improvements in health habits and um, which declines a lot, the incidence of communicable infectious diseases among children. But also we see a transition in health, which means like which are the most prevalent uh, diseases in a specific population. And the epidemiological transition, this term epidemiological transition, Omran developed it in 1971 in this paper. He mentions that's a shift from a prevailing poor health and high death rates. And these uh, death rates mostly related to communicable diseases occurring especially among the young population. And it transitions into a prevailing good health and low death rates. And now the deaths, most of them are caused by infectious diseases with most people dying at older ages from degenerative diseases. So you go from a, a moment in society, in the history of that society, of really poor health or higher morbidity and high death rates, high mortality. And the communicable and infectious diseases, they affect a lot the young population. And then when you have advancements in, in health habits and health services and medicine and so on, people start to live longer and people start to die more uh, due to, um, in, to degenerative diseases, right? I think everybody, my video stopped here a little bit. I think people can still hear me. The problem is that I cannot see the chat, but I don't see any message there. So I guess everybody can hear me. Um, from virtually all of human history, early death was actually a commonplace. And then starting around two, uh, 200 years ago, we have been steadily pushing death to older ages. And the survival of more people 
to even older age is a key contribution to demographic transition. So people actually live in even longer ages in specific more developed societies. And most people now survive to advanced ages. And when they survive to those advanced ages, then they die quickly after that. And the variability by age and mortality has been compressed. And we see uh, this process, which is called the rectangularization of mortality. What is rectangularization of mortality? It's exemplified here, illustrated by this graph. Let's say that a whole population in a theoretical exercise, everybody in a specific population, 100% of people, 100% of people here would be alive until the age of 100. And then after that, everybody would die. If that would happen, that means that there were no uh, deaths happening below the age of 100. Everybody would survive until age 100 and die after that. That would give a life expectancy at birth of 108. And you see if that hypothetical society existed, we would see a pattern of which would be a rectangularization of mortality. So this curve here is more close to a rectangular. And what you see in the United States, the age specific death rates between 1901 and 1910, it's this uh, white square, 1951 and 1960, we see here in this middle um, black curve. And then in 2011, you see the triangle here at the end. And what you see is that more people start to, uh, start to survive into older ages. For example, up to 50 years of age, only around 62% of people in the US survived into 50 years of age in 1901. In 1951, around 90% of the people survived until 50 years of age. And in 2011, around 95% of the people in the US survived up to age 50. So more people will start to survive into a specific age group, into a specific age. And this process happens for all age groups and it creates this process of rectangularization of mortality. The shape of the percent of the population is still alive by age groups start to have this more rectangular shape. For most of the history, life expectancy fluctuated between 20 and 30 years of age. So it means that on average, people lived only around 20 and 30 years. There's some people live longer, some, but a lot of people dying even uh, uh, earlier than 20 and 30 years. And that's a really low life expectancy at birth if you compare to nowadays. About two thirds of babies survived to their first birthday. So pretty much a third of the babies did not uh, survive uh, after the age one. So mortality was really high. And about half were still alive at age five. So a third died before the first birthday and half of them died before reaching uh, age five. And now it's 99% of them are reaching um, these ages of five. So mortality declined a lot. Around 10% of the people made it to the age 65 in the pre-modern society, and now it's around 90%. But it's still, you have a lot of variation. I was talking to Patrick before the class started about, I updated here at the end of this lecture, some new trends of the coronavirus pandemic in the US, the number of cases are going up. And he made a point, oh yeah, but it varies a lot within the US. Yes, if we have information at the state level, at the county level, or more specifically, it's good to have that. And the same thing happens here. Now 90% of the world population reaches age 65, but that level varies a lot between countries and varies even 
within specific countries. And varies also by race ethnicity, which is a major uh, source of variation of these demographic rates in, in the US. This is the female life expectancy at birth. The dark red, the, the red here shows the countries with higher female life expectancy at birth at, at least 80 years of age. So the US, Mexico, Canada, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Western Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand. And the countries with lower levels of life expectancy, or in other words, higher levels of mortality, exactly African countries. Right? So there's still a lot of variation between countries, and of course, also variation within countries. And in developing countries, for example, Brazil, the levels of mortality are higher in the Northeast. In Mexico, is the opposite. The levels of mortality are higher in the South. So that uh, regional variation happens a lot within countries. And this is just to show the variation in life expectancy. And this is life expectancy among women. In the pre-modern world, it was around 20 and 30, as we mentioned before. And this is the percentage of the female population surviving to age one, age five, 25, and 65. So only 63% of women, they between 63 and 74%, they survive up to age one. And if, uh, but that increased, for example, in, in the US and Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century to 82%. And, um, and data for more recent years uh, in the, the lowest, life expectancy at birth are experienced in sub-Saharan Africa, 46 years of age for, for women. So, but still 89% of them survive to at least age one, but this number is much higher in more developed countries, Mexico, US, Canada, and Japan, really high levels. And in the case of Japan, 93% of the population reaches age uh, 65. And here would be no births required uh, per woman for zero population growth. So how many children on average woman would need to have in order to um, replace themselves and their partners in future generations? So the 2.1 is exactly that number that I mentioned before to you, the fertility, the fertility at replacement level. But it's seen that the pre-modern world in order to have a population with the similar levels, women, they would need to have in between four and six children on average in order for the population to don't decline. And then what happens as we saw in the demographic transition is as mortality declines, life expectancy increases, then people start to realize that they don't have to have as many children for them to survive to older ages, then fertility starts to decline as well. All right, that's the discussion that we have been having throughout this semester. Life expectancy in the Roman era is estimated to have been 22 years on average. People who reach adulthood were not too likely to reach a very advanced age, although of course some did. So whenever we see those series about the Roman empire, we see all those older people older than 22 years of age, that's just, for the series is not what the reality was. The life expectancy at birth was really low in, at those times. During the Middle Ages, the plague, the Black Death, hit Europe in the 14th century, having spread west from Asia. An estimated one third of the population of Europe may have perished from the disease between 1346 and 1350. And it appears to be the same disease that exists today. So it's not really well known why it was so fatal back then, but probably because of the general poor health and few resources to battle the disease. Like basic hygiene, basic habits that we have nowadays that were not um, available, were not, were not practiced by those societies at that time. 
During uh, the Columbia Exchange, Columbus and other European explorers took diseases, horses, and guns to the American continent. And I'm talking about the whole American continent, North, Central, and South. And they brought back new foods and few new diseases back to Western Europe. And the one explanation for the relative ease with which Spain uh, dominated Latin America after arriving around 1500 is exactly because explorer had immunity to the diseases they brought compared to the devastation the diseases affected the native indigenous populations in the American continent. And during the Industrial Revolution, 1760 and 1840, that's when you start to have some improvement in, in mortality. So mortality starts to decline. The plague in Little Ice Age had receded, and exactly because now uh, production was done in a much more automated way, so more goods were produced, more food in a faster rate, the people were making more money exactly because of the changes that the Industrial Revolution brought into our society. Income improved nutrition, people were eating better, living better, improved housing, and improved sanitation as well. So life expectancy that were around 20, 30 years of age before that, now it reached around 40 years of age in Europe and the US. Was population growth a cause or effect of rising living standards? So the idea is that you start to have some improvements in living standards. So people live longer and by living longer, you have population growth. But if you have more people working in a more mechanized society, in a more efficient society, that creates more goods to the population as well and improves uh, living standards. So this question is pretty much asking what's the cause and what's the consequence? And that's not, there is not a really clear cause and consequence because both population growth actually create this group of people that now can take advantage of the industrial revolution and produce more, produce in a more efficient way and improve living standards. But by improving living standards, people live longer and by living longer, less people die at younger ages and population grow, right? So there is some reverse causality there. So there it goes in both ways. There were as many deaths to children under five as there were at 65 and over. So there were some improvements in living standards, but it's still infectious diseases were still the dominant reasons for death where the ability to kill started to decline uh, during the Industrial Revolution period. And in the 19th century, some key elements in postponing death were the belief in the power of human intervention, like so Western science started to develop by then, improved nutrition, which happened first in Western Europe, clean water, toilets, bathing facilities, all that contributed to better hygiene to the population and decreased mortality. Sewards in cities, so sanitation studies in Liverpool show that the improvement of sewage in cities actually improved the life uh, quality of the population. Vaccinations also, smallpox vaccination, for example, declined the incidence of this disease and then less people dying due to uh, smallpox. And the whole validation of the germ theory, like understanding uh, the development in science, development in, in medical science. Um, we start like Ignaz Semel, Semelweis in Vienna, the pioneer of an um, antiseptic procedure. And also we start to see some principles in surgery of cleaning procedures before doing surgery, basic things of cleaning all the instruments before proceeding with the surgery, before uh, any patient or between patients. Louis Pasteur in Paris, 
conduct the former experiments about germs and diseases and try to under better understand the causes and the spread of diseases. So it's pretty much the development in science was a major uh, factor that improved mortality in, in the world. In the 20th century, health is taken as a social movement leading to government organized universal healthcare systems in all rich countries except the US. And there is always backlash, right? Like this, all this government organized universal health systems that try to provide care to the population. It's really well established in developed countries except here in the US. And also a series of national campaigns, pro-vaccines, and more availability of vaccinations, they all improve quality of life of people. But nowadays you see all these different uh, groups, uh, anti-science, anti-vaccinations that actually go be, uh, much, um, go back in history into a period where you didn't have all this scientific knowledge. So they're pretty much um, ignoring all the scientific um, advancements that we have. And around World War II, the antibiotics emerged and they were also really good to prevent deaths during a series of diseases caused by bacteria. Oral rehydration therapy for infants and adults also prevented uh, deaths for both for children and, and older people. Advanced diagnosis, drugs, and other treatments for degenerative diseases to keep older people alive longer. And vaccinations, people say, oh, I'm not gonna vaccine my children because vaccines are related to increases in the chances of autism. And there are already some uh, really refined studies, recent studies that follow people through time. So that's longitudinal data showing that vaccines are not related to the incidence of autism. And also uh, areas that usually didn't have the incidence of specific diseases, if those populations which are usually wealthier decide to don't vaccinate, those diseases will come back again, right? So that was, for example, some, there were some incidents of really basic diseases going on in Malibu in California, exactly because some groups there said, oh, I'm not gonna vaccinate because we don't have those diseases anymore, but we don't have the disease anymore because of vaccines. If you stop vaccinating, they will come back. And over time, you see an improvement in life expectancy here for Mexico, the US and Canada. The US has data going back to 1850 and all improving through time. Life expectancy higher in the US and in Canada compared to Mexico, but these differentials have been declining over time, kind of showing that Mexico and some other developing countries are improving their living standards and also uh, declining mortality rates. The World War II is uh, taken as a turning point so here is life expectancy at birth, like the female life expectancy at birth for this continent. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so uh, life expectancy increased a lot from 1950 to 2010 for Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe, and North America. But of course, Europe and North America in 1950, they had higher rates than Latin America, Asia, and Africa. They also improved in more recent decades. But if you see the difference between this one here in Europe and Africa, it's, I mean, it's still really high, but these differences here were even higher. Or for example, here between Europe and Asia, in more recent years, the differentials are not so pronounced as it was in the 1950s. So all these improvements in health, in vaccinations, in science benefited pretty much the whole world population. 
And basically, there are two ways to postpone death to the oldest possible ages. To prevent diseases from occurring or spreading when they uh, do happen. So pretty much like related to prevention. So that's what I was talking, vaccinations, clean water, sanitation, good nutrition, and no physicians are needed in this case. And um, curing people of disease when they are sick is the second way. So it's more related to advanced technology, drugs, and skilled physicians. So we have to both work on prevention before the diseases happen, so that's why vaccinations and a good infrastructure and nutrition is good for the population, but also afterwards, a good development technology and drugs for when people get sick. And this is mostly, it's important for people, especially in older ages. In the past, the poor population uh, was skinny because only the rich could afford access uh, to enough quantities of food, not anymore. And nowadays you see a nutrition transition in the world. So the diet right now, it's really high in fat and processed foods. The diet is low in fiber and there is less exercise, less workout overall in the, in the society there is increases in degenerative diseases. So now obesity starts to be an issue in our societies and like really children in younger ages having really high prevalence of obesity. And that happens a lot, even in developed countries. And especially in the US, we see um, these issues happening here a lot, really high frequency. In this discussion about um, mortality, it's important to remember the difference between lifespan and longevity. Lifespan is the oldest age to which human beings can survive. So a French woman, she died in 2016, and she believed to have lived around 122 years and 164 days. There are some controversy about whether this data is uh, reliable. But whenever you're talking about lifespan, we are trying to understand what is the biological limit of people surviving in a specific age. So it's almost entirely a biological phenomenon. Longevity and life expectancy, what actually is the point of the main research of demographers and public health and public health researchers is the age at which we actually die as a group not as an individual. It's the expected number of years to be lived on average, on average by a group, by a particular population at a particular time. And currently it's about 71 for all humans and it has both biological and social components. So here the lifespan is more about what is the limit that humans can survive. And that's usually more related to the individual uh, biological characteristics of people and life expectancy. We are talking about an average uh, number of years lived by a whole group of people by a population. Populations with high mortality tend to have high morbidity. So high death, higher in, uh, incidence of diseases. Of course, this is not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. We may live longer, even though not being very healthy. So a main concern right now, exactly related to obesity, exactly related to less exercise, is that we might live longer to older ages, but because throughout our life, we didn't have good, uh, good nutrition and we didn't work out enough, the last years of our life, we can leave most of them with really low health really high incidences of diseases, like chronic diseases that make the last years of life not so pleasant. Humans are like most of other animals with respect to the general pattern of death by age. The very young and the old are the most vulnerable and young adults are the least likely to die. And the risk of death are relatively low 
uh, nowadays after the initial year of life. And I showed you already when we are talking about the life table. Life table use the age specific for uh, age specific mortality rates. After children reach age one, the risk of dying decreases, and then it starts to increase again until older ages. But until the middle age, the levels of mortality, the risk of death are really low. And exactly these ages in which people tend to have lower chances of dying are the age groups in which we are uh, having children, right? So between 15 and 49 years of age. So we are going beyond the middle age, mortality um, uh, increases, uh, although we have been seeing in some countries mortality increasing, like for specific reasons here in the US, we, see, we have seen an increase in mortality due to drug overdose in more recent years, but it's not increasing into the same levels as it was in the past. But if you compare to recent years, that's uh, an issue that you see in the country. And all this discussion here that I'm talking to you about the, um, these patterns of mortality in the world, this historical overview, it's from that other book on population introduction to uh, population introduction to, to human studies by John Weeks. So John Weeks is the author of this book that I took this material from it because he gives some more information that adds into our main textbook. And this is exactly what graph that we saw before, the age specific mortality rates. So you have mortality rates for all the specific age groups. And here we have Japan, Guatemala, and Nigeria. At before reaching age one, children are really likely to die. And then it goes down and it remains in lower levels until uh, middle, uh, mid ages. And then it starts to increase again at older ages. And, and the risk of dying increases a lot for older groups. Mortality also varies by sex. Women uh, have a lower probability of death at every age from the moment of conception. And here we are talking about like um, women compared to men, if they have this similar um, opportunities in the country, if they have access to similar education, if they have access to good jobs as men do, if they have access to health treatments, if they have access to uh, nutrition in the same way as men, they will have lower chances of dying at every single age uh, compared to men. So pretty much if we have a society in which women have the same opportunities as men, they will live uh, longer than men. However, some societies, exactly because we see some gender inequalities, uh, we, women having lower status and having less access to food when they are, they are young and less access to healthcare, less education, lower earnings, that will affect their mortality. And in some of these developing countries in which women don't have access to all these um, resources in the same way as men, they might experience an increase in mortality. Right. And mortality varies by a lot of other um, characteristics of like where people live and individual characteristics as well. So people living in urban areas, they have uh, better health and lower mortality than those living in rural areas. Islams usually have lower, uh, infra worse infrastructure, no treated water, no sewer system. So they are bad for health compared to more central areas. Bad educated people live longer than low educated people. People in a higher socioeconomic status live longer than poor people. And race ethnicity also provides some differentials as we're gonna see in the US. Um, 
African Americans have uh, worse mortality outcomes than the white population. And usually married people have better health outcomes. And that's not, um, and that's the same way. It's also there is some reverse causality there because usually people tend to get uh, married when they have good jobs and when they have a good education on average. And so they usually reach a good level of education and have a good job and then they decided to marry. And those people that are then married, they, there is some self-selection in that case, that those people already have a better health, already have a better background throughout their lives, and then they tend to be married, and they tend to have better health, right? So it's not saying that the fact that you get married means that you're gonna uh, live longer. It's more in this process of how society works, usually, People that have a, a wealthier background when they were children, they tend to have going to go uh, have better educational outcomes, get good jobs, and uh, getting married throughout their reproductive ages and having better health until the end of their lives. And um, just to go a little further on these discussions about the different causes of death. It's, uh, I would just discuss here uh, how the diseases, they can be classified as communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases and injuries. And that's a classification by the World Health Organization. And communicable diseases include bacterial diseases, viral, protozoan diseases, maternal conditions, for example, lack of prenatal care, delivering somewhere besides a hospital, delivering at home, or usually, for example, women in rural areas in more developing countries don't have access to a hospital. Seeking unsafe abortion because there is no availability of abortion in hospitals. Perinatal conditions, so uh, the conditions surrounding birth, just before and just after birth might be bad for the maternal health and the infant health and also nutritional deficiencies. All these different factors are related to communicable diseases. And here uh, in this table, the, the rows highlighted in, uh, in gray are the ones that are classified as communicable diseases. And you have your numbers of deaths in the world in 2011 due to communicable diseases. And here we have the top 10 death rates uh, in high income countries, upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries, and low income countries. And you see uh, all these other cells here, we also have data for them. But for this specific table, we just show the top 10 in each one. So we have a three, six, nine, ten, and this is the life expectancy. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The top ten causes of death in upper middle income countries, and you see that in the low income countries, the top ten causes of death are usually exactly on the rows that are highlighted in gray. Low income countries still in 2011 most of the diseases were related to communicable. Most of deaths were related to communicable diseases. And in high income countries, most of the deaths, they were related to non-communicable diseases, the rows that are in, in white. And overall, the countries that have higher levels of mortality or lower life expectancy at birth, such as low income countries, have higher incidence of communicable diseases. And countries with lower mortality, higher life expectancy at birth, most of the diseases are related to non-communicable causes. Most of the deaths are related to non-communicable diseases. And um, these are the 10 leading causes of death in the world. So right, like more recent years, 
stroke, heart diseases, they have the highest levels. And um, I mean, it's still, these ones still have high levels, but you don't see here communicable diseases as much uh, as you saw in previous years. So here you have exactly more degenerative diseases and more um, non-communicable diseases as the 10 leading causes of death in the world. Here, it's just a graph to show the adults and children estimated to be living with HIV in 2013. Most of the population uh, affected by HIV, it's exactly the sub-Saharan African population, around like 24.7 million. And 23 to 26 is the 95% confidence interval. We are 95% certain that the adults and children estimated to be living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa is somewhere between 23.5 and 26.1 million. And these numbers are, of course, much higher than all other places in the world. This is an interesting um, graph and that's available in our uh, course website, uh, sorry, on our course textbook by Poulsen and Bouvier. Here they just do an exercise. This is actually an exercise that was done by the World Health Organization. Let's say that we have a population of 1,000 people in the world. And based on the causes of death, the death rates that we observed in 2008, what would be the number of people dying for each one of the diseases in each one of these three groups of countries, low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. So out of the 1,000 people, 677 would be dying in middle-income countries, 163 in low-income countries, and 159 in high-income countries. Why much more here? Because middle-income countries are the majority of the population in the world right now. And you have fewer countries that are classified as higher income and fewer uh, in countries that are classified as low-income countries have still a lower population. Out of these 677, 93 would be dying because of heart disease, stroke, and other cerebral vascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So, and these diseases here are really related to the ones that we saw here before, right? So the other ones here. So this, uh, we saw the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also high in middle-income countries. And in high-income countries, you see also that most of the diseases that kill people are related to more chronic diseases. In low-income countries, it tends to be a little bit more related to communicable diseases, low respiratory infection, diarrheal diseases, HIV AIDS, ischemic heart disease and malaria and so on. So, but this is just to show you that right now in the world, most of the people are dying due to heart disease, stroke and other cerebrovascular diseases, of course, in low-income countries, there is more incidence of communicable diseases, but um, they are still not a big uh, number of the population overall. As we saw in the projections of the population for the next decades by 2050 and then 21, 2100, we see that the population uh, in Africa will increase a lot and those countries usually are the ones with low income countries. So you might see a bigger number of people dying due to these diseases if there is no improvement in health as we uh, expect. And here's the life expectancy at birth. In the world, the world average in, in, in blue, more developed regions have higher life expectancy over time less developed regions in red, and the least developed regions in purple. And what you see is that all of them have been improving, but the least and less developed countries 
have faster improvements. So the differentials between them and the more developed countries have been declining over time. And then now entering on the topic about mortality and longevity in the US. Uh, mortality starts dropping gradually in response to changes in the socioeconomic conditions and the environment of modernization. In the same way that happened in Western Europe because of advancements in the industrial revolution and modernization, urbanization, much of the mortality reduction started to happen before the initiations of any uh, appreciable public health measures. It's really related to improvements in socioeconomic conditions on industrialization, on modernization. Life expectancy increased between 1900 and 2013, from 46 to 76 years of age among men and 48 to 81 among women. And most improvements happen from 1900 to 1950, exactly related to control infectious and parasitic diseases and really basic um, prevention measures like boiling bottles of boiling bottles and milk, washing hands, protecting food from flies, isolating the sick children, ventilating rooms, improving water supply, and having a sewage disposal. Since the 1950s, life expectancy improvements is due to prevention and control of chronic diseases. So up to the 1950s, most of the improvements in mortality in the US was the control of infectious and parasitic diseases. And in more recent years is exactly the control of chronic diseases such as uh, heart disease and stroke. But and when you see, for example, what is going on here in the, uh, in the world right now with the, this pandemic is that then you start to see uh, communicable disease starting to affect the population, but you, it's not just to say that everybody in the world, in the US right now, is dying only due to chronic diseases. It's just saying that most of these deaths are related to this, and in order to tackle and to improve mortality, uh, or tackle mortality and improve life expectancy, uh, most of the action is going on on these kind of diseases. An important thing that happens in the US in terms of health, it's what's called the Hispanic epidemiological paradox, is pretty much defining that Hispanics have death rates of about the same magnitude and sometimes lower than whites. And you, sh you would uh, think that the Hispanic population on average would have higher mortality than the white population because on average, they have lower socioeconomic status, they have lower education attainment and they have lower earnings and so on. But they, even though they have lower socioeconomic status uh, on average compared to the white population, they still have uh, mortality levels that are at the same level or actually lower than the white population. The Hispanic epidemiological paradox is also known as the Latino mortality paradox. And these findings are more evident for those uh, Hispanics of Mexican origin. So for example, you see that the life expectancy broken down by race ethnicity between 2006 and 2011, the groups with the highest life expectancy at birth are Hispanic women followed by non-Hispanic white women. So Hispanic women better than non-Hispanic uh, white women. Hispanic men better than non-Hispanic white men. And non-Hispanic black women are lower than the other woman and non-Hispanic black men lower than the other men. And what is interesting, this is like not controlling for anything else, it's just life expectancy, just controlling by race, ethnicity, just by breaking down by race, ethnicity. And you see that Hispanic women are above all other women and Hispanic men are above all other men. 
And on average, we know that the Hispanic population in the US have lower socioeconomic status than the white population. Why this uh, Hispanic paradox happens? Why this group of the population having lower socioeconomic status overall have better health outcomes than the white population? There are different explanations for that. One is pretty much a methodological factor. Maybe there is underreporting of Hispanic origin identification on, uh, on death certificates. Maybe some of the people dying who are Hispanic are not being classified as Hispanic in their death certificates. They are being counted as white. Maybe there is a misstatement of age. So perhaps an overstatement of the age uh, at the older ages. So maybe the Hispanics who are dying when uh, their relatives report their ages to be including the death certificates, maybe there is an overstatement of their real ages. So there is this possibility of having a methodological problem, like an issue with the data. But it could be for other factors as well, such as migration effects. In migration, as I mentioned to you before, in the theories of migration, usually the people who have better uh, health, better socioeconomic, better educational outcomes in the countries of origin are the ones who decide to move out from those countries. So on average, people who emigrate from one country to the other, on average, they have better outcomes than the population left behind. Of course, some of those that are left behind have even better socioeconomic and education and health outcomes. But on average, immigrants from a specific country have better socioeconomic uh, demographic outcomes than the population level left behind. So there is a, this healthy, might be this healthy migrant effect, self-selection of immigrants in better physical and mental health. Exactly those people that have better health, both, both physically and mental health, they are the ones who you decide to move from one country to the other. And this is, these are averages, of course, like on average, those migrants getting out from Mexico to the US, on average, they have better physical and mental health than the Mexicans that stay in, in Mexico. There is also maybe the same on bias effect. What is the same on bias effect? Maybe some Mexican Americans who are in poor health, they return to Mexico at older ages because they wanna die at their home country, at their country of origin. So there is this return migration effect. They, at older ages, they decide to go back to their home country. And when they die, they are counted in the death certificates back in Mexico, not in the US. So the mortality rates are not uh, are under uh, estimated in the US. And another set of reasons that could explain the Hispanic paradox are cultural effects. Uh, the Latino population, usually have better dietary uh, practices. They eat more healthy food than, than the white population, than Americans as a whole, and have stronger family obligations and relationships. Just the fact that you're eating with your family, you don't eat outside as much, fast food and so on, that improves your life later, your, your life standards later when you're getting older. So better diet, and stronger family ties, it's one of the reasons that maybe the Latino population live longer. And one thing is also observed. The first generation of Latinos, the ones who are born in Latin America and then move to the US have better diet and better uh, in more stronger family ties than the second generation of immigrants. What are the second generation of immigrants? They are born in the US, but their parents are from Latin America. Those people, they were raised in the US. They went to school here. 
they start to eat food here, following the cultural habits of the American society, eating, eating fast food, all this bad food that we have here, and that will affect their health later in life. So the second generation immigrants from Latin America actually have worse health outcomes than the first generation, controlling for socioeconomic status, right? If we control people by the same socioeconomic status, first generation immigrants have better health than second generation. And that's probably because of this cultural effects, diet and family ties. Another uh, important thing, whenever you're talking about uh, mortality differentials in the US is the ratio, what is called the ratio crossover. Life expectancy at birth is the lowest for blacks compared with Hispanics and whites. And we just saw that in the previous graph. For most of their lives, blacks have higher death rates than Hispanics and whites, both for women and men, right? Exactly this graph here that we saw like, um, no Hispanic black women have lower rates than white and the Hispanic woman and no Hispanic black men have lower rates than white and Hispanic men. The situation, however, changes at the very oldest ages. By late in life, death rates for blacks become lower than those for whites. And in some cases, lower than those for Hispanics, but really, really, really later in life. So this is some, some data from our uh, course textbook. This is the life expectancy at age 70, 80, 90, and 100, 70, 80, 90, 100 for Hispanics, whites, and blacks by sex. And you now understand this. We have the life table. We have the life expectancy at birth. What does it mean, this life expectancy at age 70? It means that based on data from 2010 from the US, Hispanic males that reach age 70 are expected to live another 15.4 years on average. So they will live on average up to age 65.4. Um, Hispanic women are expected to live another 18 years after they reach uh, age 70 on average. So they are expected to live up to age 88 if they reach age 70 based on data from 2010 in the US. And you see that these rates here up to age 70, the life expectancy at age 70, it's higher among Hispanic men than white men and black men the lowest up to a life expectancy at age 80, 9, 8.1, and 7.8. And then when you reach really oldest ages, then you see that the remaining age, uh, years of life among Blacks start to be in the same level as Hispanics. 4.5, 4.4, which is higher than among whites. So what is this saying? that Hispanic men who reach age 90 based on the mortality rates from this year in the US, they will live an, an additional 4.5 years. Blacks, 4.4, whites, 4.0. So there is this racial crossover in which these rates here are lower and they start to be higher. But it's really at the end of, um, at really older ages. And then at 100, 2.3 additional for men, Hispanic men, two for white men, and 2.5 for black men. And the same thing happens for women. And women actually get parity with white women by age 80, and then more by age 90, and even higher than a Hispanic woman by age 100. Right. 
What are some explanations for this racial crossover? What have been, like that, those, that explanation, that series of explanations that I talked about, the Hispanic paradox, data effects, migration effects, and culture effects, those are all reasons that previous studies haven't been investigated and they came out with those, those reasons. That's not just um, opinions. This is all these possible explanations about the Hispanic paradox is based on previous studies. Series of studies that have been done about trying to understand the Hispanic paradox in the US. The racial crossover, a series of studies have been showing also different reasons of this racial crossover. Maybe it is also related to methodology, to the data. Maybe there is age misreporting on their certificate, overstatement of ages for black men and, and black women later in their lives. But this would only postpone the crossover to later ages, not eliminate it. So it's not a, a complete explanation for the crossover. And maybe there is some variation on the population in really uh, fragile ages in later in life. The surviving elderly black population is a more robust group of disadvantaged individuals. The more frail blacks, they die before the age of 80 and 90. And this more robust group that have better health and socioeconomic outcomes, they might be the ones living longer than the majority of blacks. And then when you compare them to the whites and to the Hispanics, you see the racial crossover, right? So these explanations here again are based on a series of studies that have been trying to explain the racial crossover uh, in the US. This is the percentage distribution of the five leading causes of death now here by age, we saw by race ethnicity before the discussion. Here are the five leading causes of death among people between the ages one to 24, 25, 44, 45, 64, and 65 plus. The white are all the other causes. And these ones here are the leading causes for this age group. So accidents, homicide, suicide, cancer, and heart disease among younger people. Accidents, cancer, heart disease, 25 to 44. And as people get older and not successful, susceptible to accidents or homicide, then the chronic diseases start to be more prevalent. Cancer, heart disease, both for 45 and 64, the most prevalent ones here, 32 and 21%. And heart disease and cancer for those with at least 65 years of age. One uh, important topic on mortality is exactly the mortality of people below, be, uh, before reaching age one. So that's related to the infant mortality rate. Infant mortality rate is the most common measure of infant death. We pretty much get the number of deaths in a year to children under age one and divide by the number of babies born in that specific year and multiply by 1,000. And as we have been seeing, when we control, we have some improvements in health, in mortality, some more advancements in society. That advancement causes really steep declines in infant mortality. And the fact that children now survive to older ages causes population growth to increase a lot. So that's really related to the, those curves that we saw before or the demographic transition theory. The reduction is attributable, especially to the development of oral, oral rehydration therapy. It's pretty much a solution of salts and sugar, treats diarrhea, which is a major cause of death in young children. It was developed in, in labs and tested in the field, especially in Bangladesh. And one of its founders is still uh, has a, a teaching position in Harvard, in the Harvard School of Public Health, Dr. Richard uh, Cash. 
So this really simple solution of salts and sugar start, uh, treated diarrhea and contributed to the declines of infant mortality rates in more recent, more recent decades. This is variation of infant mortality in the world. Uh, the, in, based on data from 2015, 37 children died before reaching age one out of 1,000 live births in the world. But this number varied a lot across countries in Sierra Leone, 117 deaths to every 1,000 live births in 2015. In Japan, only 2.2 uh, deaths of children before reaching age one for every 1,000 live births based on data from 2015. And uh, these are the countries with the highest infant mortality rates. Usually countries uh, in African countries are the ones with the highest levels of infant mortality and the ones with lower levels of infant mortality exactly uh, European countries and Asian countries, right? So it's, uh, it's really related to the development of these countries as a whole. This is a, a graph that I, I actually, I, I think I might have told you, I follow this Professor Cohen from the Department of Sociology at, from the University of Maryland. I follow him on Twitter and usually he creates these different graphs. And this one here, he did it by himself using data from different agencies. And what is interesting about this graph here is that he shows similar things that we saw before, infant mortality rates in selected countries, like in India, South Africa, Indonesia, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, for example. But he also shows the data for the US as a total. The US 5.8 deaths of children before reaching age one out of 1,000 deaths, out of 1,000 births with data from 2018 and 19. But when you break the US by race ethnicity, you also see a lot of variation. Higher infant mortality rates among African Americans and then followed by American Indians, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, white, and Asian. And again, that's the Hispanic paradox, right? The Hispanic population have lower socioeconomic status than the white population in the US, but they have, uh, sorry, sorry. In this case, they have higher mortality. Yeah, they have higher mortality than the white, but not as high as we see among the Pacific Islanders, American Indians, and African Americans. And it's interesting to see that the African-American population in the US, the infant mortality rate, 2017 data for the US, it's comparable to the levels in Brazil, it's in between the levels of Brazil and Turkey. And Asians living in the US have the levels of infant mortality around the levels of the ones in France, Poland, Denmark, and Greece. I just show that you have different populations different qualities of life going on in the country. So the data for race, ethnicity groups in the US is from 2017, and for the other countries is for 2018 and 19. But it gives us an idea that there is a lot of variation. The ones with lower infant mortality rates in the US are Asians, followed by whites, followed by Hispanics, and the ones with the highest African-Americans closer to mortality in, in developing countries, right? That's why whenever you're talking about socioeconomic and demographic outcomes in the US, it's really important to break the analysis by race ethnicity for all these different uh, factors. So you better understand what's going on in the country. And this is uh, only the US, the infant mortality rates by mother's race ethnicity from 2000 to 2010. And you see again, infant mortality rates much higher for mothers who are no Hispanic black compared to women who are no Hispanic white and Hispanic 
people. So that's like a huge uh, differential of infant mortality rates by, by race ethnicity. And I will continue on this in the next class about neonatal and post neonatal mortality rates and kind of explain the differences. I, the next quiz is available on, on Canvas right now until tomorrow at noon. And after we finish this mortality lecture, I will jump into international migration. So I go first in international migration, then go back to internal migration because international migration, it's, uh, we have more discussion about international migration in the US than about internal migration. So I just wanna focus more on what's uh, main topics for us here in the US, okay? So thank you very much. And I see you guys on Thursday. Thank you.